This morning, as we gather, I want to speak on what I call keeping the fire burning. And speaking about keeping the fire burning, maybe you may be wondering, where is that fire? But we have just come from a season, and the season that we have just come uh, from is that season of prayers and fasting. And when you think of it, you would imagine that that moment was a great moment in that if you, by one way or another, you participated, then your life may not be the same. Not that your life has not been changing, but spiritually speaking, there must be a journey that you have walked with the Lord to be where you are. And if that be the case, then it happens there are many other things that come along the way. And in the process, they may cause you not to maintain the momentum of the moment or not to remain where maybe you feel you are at such a time as this. And so thinking of things that may cause you not to keep the fire burning, maybe there are circumstances and situations that come in life and they cause us not to remain, to be what we think we should or where maybe God wants us to be. And if you look at the Bible, I've also been the seeing or what you find in the Bible is that God is a God of dispensations. And a while back, somewhere, some time back, we shared on God of those dispensations. And in those dispensations, we see God is taking us from one place to the other. And in the process of taking us from one place to the other, there is that plan that God has and would want to achieve or accomplish in our lives so that we can get to what God wants us to get. And so in the Bible, in the book of First uh, uh, Acts and chapter 1, we look at the children of Israel and they're in a situation where they are speaking or Jesus had just resurrected and at that moment they are in a situation where they don't know what next. But from verse 3 the Bible tells us to whom he also presented himself alive after he, his suffering by name, many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and seeking, speaking of things pertaining the kingdom of God. Verse 4, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not for many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And I want us to first hold it at that. Because what he said next, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set for by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. But verse 6 is key because at that point of asking, who are you going to restore the kingdom of God to us now? That question alone takes us back to a period in the Bible which we call the intertestamental. And the intertestamental period is that period which was between the last prophecy in the Bible, the book of Marakai, and the book of Matthew, which is the first Bible book in the New Testament. That place or that space that is called intertestamental is a period of 400 years. And the Bible tells us within that 400 years, God was silent. There were no prophets. There were, God was not speaking as he had always spoken. He was silent. So it is called the in-between testament. But within that time, as much as God was silent, there were many things that happened. And so in the, those things happening, the children of Israel go to a place where they will move to first act chapter 1. And they're asking the Lord, will you restore the kingdom of Israel? or the kingdom at this time. Why was that the case? It is because within those 400 years, the children of Israel 
went through a lot of changes and challenges because they were ruled by many empires. The first thing that happened was the children of Israel had just come from the rulership of the Babylonian. And so at that time, what just happened is that they started or they entered into the rulership of the kingdom of the Persian. And thinking of that, that changed the way they lived. Because at that point in time, the king or King Cyrus, who came into power, enabled or allowed them to have some freedom of some sort. And it's at that time that the Nehemiah approached the king and asked him for favor to go and rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Because the walls had been pulled down or the church had been destroyed. And there are many things that happen because though King Cyrus was good and gave them favor, the other king that came is because he was conquered. And after he was conquered, we hear or we get to see someone else, the other kingdom that took over was the kingdom that was ruled and which was by Alexander the Great. Praise the Lord. When Alexander the Great came into power, he came and he thought of a nation or like a world that would be controlled from one place. And so the Bible, uh, we read from history that he conquered all the nation around there. And as he conquered those nations, it was possible that good things and bad things happened. And one of the bad things that happened is at that time there came what we call Hellenization. Hellenism is where you intertwine the cultures of the Greeks with the culture of the Jewish. And so instead of worshipping their God as they had worshipped, they changed and started worshipping other gods. So they are in a space where they knew of temple worship, they did things, they sacrificed, but here is a king who has come and has conquered the world, Jewish or Israel being part of them, and introduced what we call Hellenism. And this continued. Without taking too much time, they went under other rulership. There was the rulership of the Persian, who uh, after the Persians, the, the, the uh, Egyptians came into power, or the uh, Syrian came into power, after which they were also conquered by the Egyptian, and lastly, they were conquered by the Romans. And so when you read the Bible at some point, you are wondering, how come there was a herald there was the, Rome, the Roman Empire that was fighting Jesus or that crucified Jesus. But the whole story is found in those 400 years of God being silent. And being silent, it means then people looked for ways. Ways to worship God. And in that space, that's where we learn that there came some groups like the Pharisees, the Sudasis, the Zeroths. The Herodisms came out of that space. And in that space then, they forced the children of Israel to stop worshipping God as they had always worshipped him. They changed from worshipping their God from internally to externally. They changed their worship. There were no sacrifices. They were burnt. They could not worship their God. And in the middle or in the process of that, there were the many things that happened. The culture of the Greeks was good, sophisticated. It was those things that you would want in life. Those things that appeal to the physical being or physical body. And so they were assimilated and they got into those spaces or into that kind of worship. That is to say that if we are in the space that we are in, God being the God of dispensation, there are moments that will come in our lives and those moments may be good because the Bible tells us oh, in that history we learn when the children of Israel were in Egypt, they prospered. Things were happening and in that prosperity, they also forgot God because they got to feel like this was it. In that place, they were also taught of worshipping gods of fertility. Gods who would change things. If they wanted rain, they would go out and call for rain through those gods. And so they felt like they wanted to settle in that space. Though that happened and good and bad things happened, they were conquered. 
the Jerusalem that they knew, the place of worship, the temple was no more. The kingdom of Israel was no more. They had no place that they called a home because some of them had been taken captive. And so as they were in that space, the Bible tells us that though God was silent in those four years, God was also working to speak to the children of Israel. How was he to speak? God was preparing for the coming of his son, Jesus Christ. And so from the last prophecy of Malachi to the next prophecy, though God was silent, he was not literally silent. He was still working because he used the Greek to bring the Greek, which was made the language of everyone, so that it would be used to reach people when Jesus came into the space. It is the same language that the Bible was translated from Hebrews to the Greek or to Greek that we had the first translation of the Bible. And then in the same space that God used the Romans to build roads, to make, uh, to put courts and to organize things and to put laws so that when Jesus came, would use the same space that he would reach or would preach the word to the world. And so it means that in some of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, God being God of dispensation, it is possible he may be silent in your life today, but he's still not silent because he's working out something. And as he works something, it's to say that even after the children of Israel were in captivity, he had promised that after 70 years, he would restore them. And when King Cyrus came into power, he restored the children of Israel. All the things Nebuchadnezzar had taken, he returned them to Jerusalem. Saying that God is God of a promise. And if he has promised anything, then God will bring it to pass. I don't know what God has promised. He have, if I have said that he will make you, he still remains a God of covenant. He will not change. No matter the circumstance, no matter what happens, God still will keep his promises. But that now takes us to where we would want our, us to ask ourselves, why was God doing all this thing? Why was God causing all these things to happen? And so that brings us to the first part which we ask ourselves, what is God's plan to keep our fire burning? And we have just read that in that process of keeping the fire burning, God would want us to move from that space of retaining the old temple because it was the temple that the children of Israel fought so much for so that they could offer, uh, offer sacrifices. But when now John comes into the scene, he introduces something else. And the thing that John introduces when he comes and speaks of the person that is coming after him, we learn that John is telling us that there is one who is coming. And the one that is coming after me, he am not worthy to untie his shoes. Because when he comes, then he will baptize you with the fire or with the water and spirit. What is God saying after he had kept silent for this long? He's trying to say that the moment you have always sought to worship me will not be the same again. I'm moving the worship from the temple where you offered the sacrifices where you brought animals, where you fought so much so that you would keep those uh, sacrifices. But I'm moving you to the next thing. And the next thing that God is taking us to is where we find ourselves as a church. And as a church, we have said that we are in a dispensation of the Holy Spirit. Because trying to summarize all that happened in the 400 years, we see the order of the uh, uh, the, the patriarchs, the age of the patriarch, where we had Abraham all the way to the next space of what God introduced as a new dispensation, which was the mosaic, the law of Moses. And so there are people offered sacrifices. They did everything that was meant to be done in the temples. But eventually, God being the God of order and dispensation, he introduces us to the Christian age. And this is where we are. Being in the Christian age then, it means God is coming to speak to us about the new worship. And so the voice of John the Baptist in bringing Jesus into the world, he says he appeared in the desert 
as a voice that was speaking, calling people to repentance. And he's called people to repentance. The Bible says people came and uh, repented and were baptized. But this baptism was just that baptism by water. But so Jesus stands, uh, John stands there and he says, Behold, I'm a voice of the one that is coming after me. But as he come, I'm not worthy to untie his shoes because he has more authority. And he wants to change you or to transform you from being worshippers. Worshippers that are seeking to retain that temple, that glorious, magnificent temple that will be, was built by Solomon and which was built by many others. And he says, our time has come. And that time is that time that he wants to cause us to enter into a new space. And in that space, in uh, Matthew 1, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 3, 11, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I. Powerful than I. Whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. What the Bible is telling us from that scripture is John has already introduced Jesus. And introducing Jesus, he goes further to explain what will become of his coming. And he says, the one that I will introduce, he has come, but also on his hand, he does not want you to carry sacrifices or anything else. But he's one who wants you to repent and to start bearing fruits, fruits that will remain. Because if that doesn't happen, he says, then this person comes also with a winnowing. So that he will be able to thresh that which has come to him and separate chaff from that which is good. And whatever is not right, then he promises will be burnt by fire. What Jesus, uh, John is saying, just at that point, the very first time he speaks, he takes us from the introduction of the coming of Jesus Christ and takes us to the last moment of judgment of what will happen at the end of time. Why is he saying that? Because immediately he was doing that, then a few people came. And the people that came were the Pharisees that had arisen during those 400 years as an alternative to worship. Why were the Pharisees there? They were the teachers of the law at that time during the 400 years of God's silence. They were teachers of the law. They were experts in the law of God. And what were they telling the people? They were explaining of the, uh, the, the law of God to the people. Like you came to them and they wanted to tell you, this is what the Lord says. Though they, they themselves were not believers or they did not believe in God. The difference is some of them believed of resurrection. The Pharisees believed of resurrection. Yet the Sadducees did not believe of resurrection. And so whatever they were telling the people, they were telling the people, this is good for you. You can do this. They were the enforcers of the law at that time. And some of the things they did, they also came with their own instruction and taught people how to live, not according to God's desire, but according to what they thought was the right interpretation of the word of God or the law of God. But what do we learn from this? Is learning that during those moments of silence in our life, that there are many things that would crop up, things that would make us to turn away from God and start putting our own laws in place that can help us to cope with life. And such circumstances are circumstances that we are in, maybe even as a nation. There could be challenges, and it's possible that God would be so silent in your life, and you are wondering, what should I do? How do I move on with life? What is it that I will do to change my circumstances? But then when you are in that space then, the word of God is coming to tell us when Jesus comes into the space, then he's saying a time is coming and that time is now. When the true worshipers will worship God in truth and in the spirit. And why is that so? It's because we will no longer go to Jerusalem. We no longer need to look for a mountain, a place that we will set apart and say, this is the place that we worship God from. 
Because all this time, what had not happened and why there were these people is because they thought a time has come. This person by the name of Jesus have come into the space or into our space. He has taught us and now he is dead and he has resurrected. And so we are thinking that he needs to restore us back to being a kingdom of Israel. So that we would have a king, we would have judges, we would have prophets that would speak to us. But God is not God of the old order because God wants us to move into a new space. And the space that God wants us to move us into is that space where the uh, Samaritan woman meets Jesus at the well in, book, in the book of John chapter 4. And at that space then, this woman comes to Jesus and I know that we know the story and the story, cutting it uh, short, is to say, she comes there and she thinks she has so many things. And her cares and worries was her concern. But as much as Jesus knew that she had many issues, she he was not so much bothered as to how to solve those problems. It was not his interest first to solve his pro her problem because he first wanted this woman to know there is a new order a new dispensation that brings the Samaritan from half the fathers they had been put in the order of the children of Israel and bring her closer to being one among the children of God. And speaking to her, then Jesus says, woman, a time has come. And that time is now that the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. And if that be the case then, God desires that we also get to that space of asking ourselves, what is it that I'm looking for? As I come to the house of God every other Sunday, am I looking for a restoration of that which worked for me many years ago? Or I have moved with God into the new dispensation, the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. What are my sacrifices? Have you been changed by things that have been happening around you and you are no longer worshipping God from your spirit? But our worship could be like that of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Sadducees where we are no longer worshipping God for who he is, but we are keepers of the law. We want to tell this woman that is caught in the act of adultery. When she comes before, uh, uh, he's brought before Jesus, then everybody that stood there says, stone her. Because that was the order in the old dispensation. But Jesus trying to change the narrative. He says, if you have not done anything, then be the first one to cast your stone. This is the order that the Lord would want us to, to bring us to. I don't know whether it has come to you that you would think or sit and start thinking of yourself and asking yourself, where am I in terms of worshiping God? Because you could be caught up in that space of feeling like you are in God, but you had already left and you are worshiping God, not from inside you, but from worshiping God by keeping the law of the word order. Number two, or number three, God is a disruptor of men's order. And why is God a disruptor of men's order? Because up until this very minute when God is telling the disciples that I am not the one who will decide as to what will happen because that has not been put to me. We see prior to that, Jesus also speaking to the disciples. And as he speaks to the disciple, in the book of Luke, in chapter 9, verse 28 to 36, it brings a situation which had occurred in the Bible. And this is a situation where Jesus is also speaking to the disciples and he's asking them a question. And the question is to Peter, he says, who do people think I am? And in asking who do people think I am, then they say, they say you are Elijah. You are Moses. You are one of the prophets. But Jesus turns that question and asks to the disciples, who do you think I am? And that question would be our question today as to who do you think Jesus is? Not to the people or what people say, but you as a person, who do you think he is? 
And that's why we began by asking, do you know my Jesus? Because Jesus has to be, to be so personal that you know him, not because people talk of him, but you know him as he is to you. Sometimes back I had this feeling and I asked myself, do I really love God? And in asking myself whether I love God, I thought of the grace that we always say. And you say, and the grace of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And you ask, I asked myself, do I feel that uh, fellowship of the Holy Spirit? And the love of God, do, does that love of God, is it felt inside me? Or I just say it because I have to say it. And I asked the Lord that, God, I want to feel you. That every time I would say that prayer, I will not say it for the sake of saying it. But I will say it, and the love of God, I will feel that love in my heart. Because not until we get into that space. Because what Jesus said next, that Peter, upon that revelation, upon this lock, it was not the lock, rock somewhere, but he was saying, upon that revelation, that you have received, then I will build my church. What church was he talking about? He was talking that the old temple that you worshipped in, where you offered sacrifice, is no more. But the moment we realize who Jesus is, then the new order, which is the new temple, which is not physical again, is built on the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's from there our worship takes a turn. Because we realize we are not just serving God because I came to church. But I can have God anywhere I am. I can have fellowship with him wherever I am. Because life or my heart has been changed. The amazing thing is the Bible talks to us from the same scripture. About Peter, John and James. This moment of transfiguration. And when they had been there with Jesus. Then something happened. That they realized as they prayed. Then Moses and Elijah appeared to them. And the glory that came down was just a reflection of what will be at the end of times. And this was also speaking to them by saying, that God that you have believed, or this Jesus that you have known, though you may not have been told by anyone about him, though you may not have realized who he is, just as Peter had just realized a few verses before then, God wanted the other two also to realize who he is. And so in his appearing, God, or the voice of God, spoke about Jesus and says, this is my loved son. Honor him. Obey him. Which was to say, God was revealing himself no longer, or was making himself known to the disciples, though they had been with Jesus for quite a while. Unfortunately, later, we realize the same out of the three John and James went to their mother and said, would want you to approach Jesus and ask him for some favor, whether we can sit on his left or in his right. And Jesus says, what you have asked is not possible. Because if you are to sit on my left or on my right, it is not for me to decide, but my father who has set it for those who he has prepared it for. Which is saying, as you seek me, you don't need any favors to be found in me. You don't need a relationship to be found in me. But the moment you worship me, then the Father has prepared that at the end of times, he will give you an opportunity to be seated next to me. Praise the Lord. What he is saying is that God does not maintain the order of men. It is not the people that will take you to where Jesus is. But as you learn to worship him in truth and spirit, there are moments that God will bring you to where he is. Because that's the entry that God would want to give us to himself. And so saying, then, if you don't get to that space of knowing God, you will always be asking for favor. Like, God, can it be done? Yeah? Like they came to Jesus and they are saying, you don't care about every other person. You are so selfish because your heart is so much tied into the things of the world. You are just thinking, what is it that can be given me? Not with a concern for every other person. Because when the other ten heard of that, they were so passionate or they were so angered by such a request. 
Because had they known that Jesus had come, not just for one, but for everyone, they would not have had such a request. And so Jesus speaking to them, he says, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, then you have to be a servant. If you want to be put in the first place, that you have to be a slave which is disrupting the order of men, where we know if I want to be great, I have to be in this pulpit to look as the greatest person of the day. But Jesus is saying to be great is not because I have this opportunity to stand before you. It's if I serve you. Because he says, I as a son of man did not come to be served, but to serve others. And that is the space that God wants us to get to. Lastly, is asking ourselves, why are you in church today? Why did you come to church this morning? And we know the Bible talks about what God would want to do when we come to his house. Because 2 Timothy and chapter 3 and verse 16 tells us about the word of God which is inspired of the Holy Spirit. And he says that word will teach us, will cause us to be trained, to be rebuked, to be corrected. So that we become the people that God wants us to become in him. And thinking of that then, it means God who was introduced by John the Baptist, who he says, that person is so great that I may not have a chance to do anything about him. But John also takes us quickly to First John, and he says, that person is the word. And that word then, without him, nothing that is would be. And so if we think of him then, God is, or Jesus, or the word of God is trying to tell us that when we gather as an assembly, we are coming to meet Jesus, who is the word. And you remember Jesus speaking, and he's speaking about himself. He says, I'm the bread of life. Whoever eats me will hunger no more. I'm the, uh, if you drink my bread, then you shall not thirst anymore. So it means that when we come together, we are coming to receive that word so that as we go forth in the next one week, we'll be so empowered to go and do exploits for God. Praise the Lord. We'll go and do exploits for God because we, the Bible continues to describe this Jesus. And as it describes him as the word, it says that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword all a double-edged sword. What it means, it can separate bone from marrow. It can cause things to happen around your space. It can divide soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and intentions of heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered, exposed before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And so as we come into his presence, we are coming so that we can lie bare before him. So that he can reveal our thoughts, our intentions, and give us something that will carry to go and influence our world. And how do we do that? We do that when we realize what God desire or desires of us, that instead of offering those sacrifices in the old order, our sacrifice will be coming to him and agreeing with him to work in us so that as we go forth, then he will go and accomplish that which needs to be accomplished. You know, church, for us to keep the fire burning, it will be dependent on the knowledge that you have about God. And you can do exploits or wonders in proportion to what you know about God. Praise the Lord. The things that you can cause to happen in the world out there is based on the knowledge of the word that you know or the God that you know. No wonder in Daniel he says, them that knew their God, they will do exploit. What is it that you know about God? Has the word of God become that thing that changes you? That as you bring your offering before God for it to be acceptable, you don't wait until you are in the service. But you have been planning of how to bring your sacrifice. And the greatest sacrifice that the Lord wants of you, not the animal, because we are in the new order. He wants you as a sacrifice. And as you bring yourself as a sacrifice, then you come telling the Lord, today God I know my sacrifice that I am, 
I'm so bitter about so and so. I want to come into your house and if your word is like a hammer, I want to be able to break the rocks that in my heart that you can have a space and that I can hear you. As you come into the service, then you're coming telling the Lord, God, I am so jealousy. I am not able to let other people enjoy what they have. But as I enter into that space as a sacrifice, deal with my jealousy. Deal with my anger. Deal with my pain. Deal with me, with me in every other way that I become the sacrifice that you want me to be. That would be the new order that the God wants us to enter into. Because the Bible speaks of men and women that got to know God in that way. And every time situations and circumstances came to their life, they stood because that word that came into their life burnt so much that the power of God was seen. And one of them is Stephen. Stephen is being stoned. But Stephen looks up and he says, I can see my master standing up. And so in turning back to their people, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. When you look at Jesus and he becomes glorified in your circumstance, in your situation, then it causes everything else to melt. And that was the same with Joshua and Caleb. They went and when they saw the giants, instead of confessing negative about what would happen, they say, we can see the Lord is giving us the land. We can go and possess because the land is full of milk and honey. Today, as we stand here, there are many circumstances. Maybe we would be in those spaces just like it were in those 400 years of God's silence. And you are wondering, where next? What next? What will become of me? But for you to be able to move to the next space, then Jesus in what we have just read in the book of Acts chapter 1, in answer to that question, God will you restore the kingdom of Israel this time around? He says, when the spirit will come upon you, then you shall be my witnesses. What he is trying to say is, all things notwithstanding, over and above the circumstances that we are in, there is something that needs to be working in you that will cause you to make a difference in life. And that difference will not come when we don't know God because it's that spirit who will help us to know what the Lord is saying to us at a moment or in a time as this. What does the Lord want you to do? If things are so bad, what does the Lord want you to do? The Lord wants you to work with him in the due dispensation. In the order of Christian age. In the order of the Pentecost. In the space that we are in. And as we go with him, then we make the difference. That is not to say that God is not concerned about our needs. He's concerned. But remember, if you follow Jesus in the New Testament, and he's speaking to the needs of the people, he says, first seek the kingdom of God. With all its righteousness and all these other things shall be what added unto us so god is not ignorant that we have needs but as much as we have needs his greatest concern is do you know him how do you know him do you want the old order do you want the kingdom of israel to be restored so that you can bring animal sacrifices or you want to be that animal that says it's me that the Lord wants. It's me that the Lord wants to deal with. It is me that the Lord wants to change. It is me that the Lord wants as a church. We have gathered here this morning, but as we gather here, the greatest church that the Lord is so pleased about is not this building. Those, this building is great. This building is wonderful, but he's much more concerned about the building that you have become. Because in the book of Revelation and chapter 21, from verse 3, he says, And now the tabernacle of God is amidst people. 
He is no longer concerned of the tabernacle because in the Old Testament, every time the children of Israel moved, they built a tabernacle, which was the form of a temple, but this was now a movable temple that everywhere they went, they carried it. But what is the book of Revelation saying? The tabernacle of God is now a midst man, which means that God has come to dwell among them. And he finishes that portion by saying, and they, his people will be his people, and he will be their God when we enter into that tabernacle. God wants us to move into that space that our worship will change, will be different, will walk with him, and that he will be able to transform us. What makes you to stand out? Lastly, the people that have gotten to get to that space, Peter is a testimony. That the timid Peter that could not do much when he entered into that space, then the Bible tells us he preached one day. After that, he baptized him, and 2,000 men came to the Lord. You will not do exploits until we get to that space where we receive. The anointing of the Holy Spirit becomes so evident in our lives. Then we'll go and we exploit. The fire that the Lord wants is not to destroy us. Though the fire of God is destructive, it burns, it consumes. Elijah gives us a testimony that when he invited the fire down of the Lord and it came down, it consumed all the sacrifices. It even leaked the water that had been poured. And there was a difference. And that day people said, there is no other God except the God of Elijah. Do people, will we get to that space? Will the world testify there is no other God except your God? The world is waiting. We are waiting. The Lord is waiting that you can enter into that space so that he can glorify himself. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you this morning. Even as we gather in this space, we are not ignorant. Our Father, we would be in different spaces of our lives. But we want to acknowledge that, Lord, you are God of seasons and dispensation. And that, Lord, you know each one of us, even not only by how we look, who we are, but even by our names, even as per your word. You have said that you will not allow even a hair from us fall without your knowledge because you know us. And so, Lord, I want to pray for your people this morning that, Lord, as we have gathered and as we have sat at your feet, how I pray that that word we may have heard it could be one, it could be many, but I know that you have spoken to each one of us at their points of need. How I pray that, Father, you may come and cause us to know that which you desire of us, how you would desire that we may move from whatever spaces that we may be in our Father and arise our Father, and that the fire of the Holy Spirit, Father, will continue or will start burning in our hearts afresh in the name of Jesus. That, Father, in the name of your Son, we will arise. And, Father, we will be able to stand, O oh God. And that to which our Father has opposed, that which has stood against any one of us. Father, we shall be able to stand in the power of the Lord and oppose it to the glory of your name. We pray, our Father, that our worship, my Father, is going to change. It's going to be transformed. We are going to be the Peter of today, our Father. That the question of who Jesus is in our lives shall not be a guesswork, our Lord. But that each one of us shall have evidence of who Jesus is into our lives, our Father, and what he can do. We ask that your word, that's the truth, the word that transforms the heart of men, the word our Father that can give us life, that word shall also have space in our life. The, uh, Jesus will come and indwell us because the tabernacle of God is now with men. That Father, you come and have your space in our lives that we may arise and do that which you need of us. How we ask that the week that is ahead, our Father, your hand shall rest upon us so powerfully that as we go forth using your word as a hammer, we shall break everything that shall look so hard, everything that shall be so big ahead of us. Father, by your word, we shall create spaces for ourselves and that, Father, we shall receive by faith that which we ask of you. We give you thanks this morning and honor you. 
For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.